Okay. So you should be able to see my screen, the presentation mode, and my cursor as well, right? Awesome. So thank you everybody for joining for this seventh lecture. Is it? For the seventh lecture of the yeah, it is seven. quantum biology seminar series. And this lecture was supposed to be given by Sandra Prado, an expert in the field, but unfortunately she has some problems and she cannot give the lecture. So you're kind of stuck with me, uh, but I will do my best to, to get these things. Okay, so even before introducing myself, I want to talk to you about this guy. So this is Nemo. Maybe you know him from the movie Finding Nemo. And in the movie, he gets captured, I think. And uh, his dad goes on a trip to try to find him, rescue him. Uh, so what happens in real life with clownfish or anemone fish, like Nemo, is a bit different. And I'm just going to go over that quickly. So you have your anemone fish, a female and a male. And when they reproduce, it goes something like this. So the female lays eggs and then she's like, okay, I'm out of here. My job is done. That's good. And after that, the male fertilizes the eggs and actually he sticks around for a little while guarding the eggs and making sure that no predator is eating the eggs. But after the eggs hatch, you get hundreds of larvae and these larvae are spread all over the place by the ocean currents. So, so if these is where the larvae were born, maybe after a while they're just spread around all over the place. But there's evidence that suggests that these fish, when they metamorph, uh, they actually swim back to where they're from. And the question is, how does that happen? How do the fish know how to navigate and how to go back home? So I'm going to give you a whole bunch of options. And uh, you can type in the chat the, the answer that you think is correct. So maybe. I don't know, they do like all of us would do, they use Google Maps. Or maybe they ask for direction to other fish. Maybe the fish in the ocean are like people in Los Angeles and they really like to talk about streets and directions. Or maybe they look at the sun and the moon and they figure out where they have to go. Or maybe they use the ocean currents. It, there was, it was the ocean currents that brought them there in the first place, right? Or maybe they use visual clues, or smell, or even sound, or they use the Earth's magnetic field. What do you think is the answer? There's a lot of options here. Just going to give you a couple of minutes. Right. OK, I see a bunch of Earth's magnetic field. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's like 100% magnetic field, except for one, which is directions. And the answer is smell, actually. And this was all just to introduce the topic of today's lecture, which is olfaction. And I will talk about uh, olfaction in general, the importance of olfaction, and then I will go through the history and the milestones in the development of the, of the olfaction theory. And while doing that, I will introduce the concept of quantum tunneling. And uh, by the end of this lecture, I will try to convince you that we actually use this weird quantum effect to, actually, to smell. So, Let's start off by just telling you a little bit about myself. And um, I'm originally from Italy, from the northern part of Italy. And uh, I actually started off my academic career as a mechanical engineer. 
uh, doing my bachelor between University of Modena and University of Exeter. And after that, I decided that I, you know, I don't really like money. So I moved into physics and I did my master's in engineering physics in Milan. And afterwards, I decided to stick with it and do a PhD in condensed metal physics between Milan and MIT, where I was studying spintronics and uh, two dimensional materials. And after that, I moved into some weirder stuff and I did my first postdoc at MIT doing topological quantum computing, which is a weird flavor of quantum computing that involves like teleportation and very weird stuff. And after that, I moved into something even weirder, which is quantum biology. And it's where I am now doing the postdoc in Clarice's lab and Qubit lab at UCLA. And all of this is to tell you that I'm no biologist. So if I'm not super strict and rigorous on the biology, that's why, forgive me in advance. Uh, but the common denominator in all of my research was that most of the uh, instrumental techniques were based on the concept of quantum tunneling. So let's start off by taking into account the importance of olfaction. And I want to do a social experiment right now. And hopefully you all know how to raise your hand in Zoom, right? And I want to ask you a Boolean question, just yes or no. If it's yes, you just raise your hand. And the question is, did you ever get COVID? Please raise your hand. I expect many hands. Otherwise, you're probably lying or didn't take a test. Uh, okay, okay. Just a few. And okay, so. Let's remove the hands, please. Maybe not so much help. And the next question is, did you lose your sense of smell while you had COVID? No? I certainly did. And it took me actually a couple months to gain it back. And in that time, I realized that olfaction is actually pretty important. You use your olfaction to enjoy the foods and drinks that you like. While I had no sense of smell, I could eat like pizza and broccoli and it was exactly the same. I never ate so healthy in my life because it was just the same. So I would just eat a bunch of vegetables. And, but it's not just to enjoy the foods and the drinks. It's also a warning mechanism. So if we smell something bad, it's our body that tells us that, oh, you probably shouldn't go near them. You shouldn't eat that rotten food or that pineapple pizza because that's illegal. And, but we're very bad as humans at smelling. And uh, actually animals are much, much better than us. And for instance, they use, olfaction for survival and uh, they can smell for food and they can also smell for predators in certain cases to just know that a predator is coming so you better hide. And sharks, for instance, have two thirds of their brain that is devoted to just olfaction and they can smell a drop of blood from miles away. But it's not just the survival of the individual, it's the survival of the species as well. Animals can smell pheromones, so they pretty much know when the other animal is ready to procreate. Uh, okay, so I hope I convinced you that olfaction is important, and I want to just go back briefly to our friend Nini. So, how do we actually know? I know that you trust me and everything, but how do we actually know that Nemo actually smells his way home? So what they did was to perform an experiment, which is something like this. 
and uh, you have a, a lab setup where you have a stream with two currents, and they place the some color reefs in each side. One is coming from the native reef of the fish, and one from a very similar reef, but from far away. And what they observed was that the clownfish always swim towards the native reef. So they must know somehow how to get there. But in this lab setup, you have no clear visual clues. They cannot use like a clear sound that they can recognize. The fish is not really uh, compatible with a magnetic compass and there's no ocean current really. And uh, so what they said is olfaction is probably how they navigate back. But to be even more sure about this, they performed a similar experiment this time on salmon. So this is a similar concept, but this is done in a real river. And the researchers basically went fishing for salmon. They got salmon over here and they tagged the salmon and they would release it downstream. The salmon would just swim upriver and same as the clownfish, they always go where they come from. So they must know their way back somehow. Uh, but there's another step to this. Actually, they tried to block their nostrils with some cotton. And uh, after doing that, actually the salmon doesn't know where to go anymore. And so this is actual proof that olfaction is actually how they can navigate. So all of this is amazing, nice, but how does olfaction work? So uh, let's go through the steps. The first thing that you do in olfaction is you suck air in through your nose, right? But uh, actually your nose has no active role in the olfaction. It just acts as a filter for the air. So if you ever wondered, yes, also all the more can smell. And uh, so everything that is important in the olfaction mechanism happens over here in this region that is called the olfactory epithelium. Uh, so let's take a look, closer look at that. And you have that the first thing that happens is that you have other molecules that are sucked in through the nose and they get captured by these olfactory receptors. So uh, after they get captured, they stimulate the opening of ion channels where ion can flow in the cells. And uh, this makes, after you detect a few, just a few molecules, they make the neurons fire, which means that they send a, an electrical signal to this part here, which is called the olfactory bulb, that then kind of processes the signal and sends it to high, higher parts of the brain. So this is how it works in general. And we will focus on arguably the most important part, which is the actual detection of the molecules in this lecture. So the first question that we can ask is that, okay, we have these olfactory receptors and we have the molecules, but can a single receptor smell every different odor out there? And this was answered by these two people, Richard Axel and Linda Bach, which won a Nobel Prize for this in 2004. And uh, what they discovered is that humans have about 300 olfactory receptor types, and they're all a little different. So maybe that's a hint that they're used for single odor detection. But still, we can detect about 10,000 different smells. So how can we do that with just 300 types of, the, of olfactory receptors? So to answer that, they use genetically altered mice where they have that the olfactory neurons, when they're activated, they die blue. So they just turn blue. And so what they did is just make them smell something and look at how many uh, neurons were blue. So 
for a, a single order, only one in 1,000 receptor actually turn blue. And rats have about 1,000 types of receptors. So this is proof that the our olfactory receptors are specialists, so they specialize in a single odor. And other things that they found out were that odorants can actually activate multiple neurons, and that a single neuron can detect several different odorants. And so how they explain that we can smell 10,000 different smells is uh, that they use these neurons as sort of letters in the alphabet to form the words. So we just 26 letters, something like that, we have in the alphabet, we can produce thousand different words, like thousands and millions and whatever. Uh, and another way to see it is that if you have your ol olfactory receptors, maybe this one is devoted to, to detecting yellow or and this one to detecting blue, let's say. Uh, but the signal upstream is maybe something completely different, which is green. That's how I see it. Um, so the actual mechanism for the receptors to uh, detect the molecule uh, is still under debate. And for many, many years, uh, it was thought that this mechanism was this lock and key mechanism, it's called, uh, where the receptor can be thought about as a, as a lock and your molecule is a key. So only a very specific key can fit the receptor and open it. So in this case, you have the molecule, you have the receptor, the molecule, the right molecule gets in, these triggers the opening of the ion channel and all the process downstream. But there are some limitations to this. And first limitation is that you have completely different molecules which have exactly the same smell. So you can see all these molecules here and they all smell like musk. And on the other hand, you have very similar molecules like this one, which has completely different smells. So this one smells like urine and this one is completely odorless. So this doesn't really work, you know? And then this guy came along, which is called Michael, Mike, Malcolm Dyson. And uh, he just noticed something. And there's a huge group of molecules that are called mercaptans. This is just an example, which have this terminal group, which is a uh, sulfurite red group. And uh, all of these, which have this sulfurite red terminal bond, they all smell like rotten eggs. So they all smell as the same. So he was like, these must have something to do with the smell. And what he proposed was that maybe the receptors can pick up particular bond vibrations. So the molecular vibrations is what, is what we smell, not the molecule itself. But at that time, which was the late 1920s, uh, there was no way to measure molecular vibration until just a few years later, Raman spectroscopy was invented. And Raman spectroscopy consists on shooting a monochromatic laser towards molecules. And uh, some of these light that you shoot on the molecules will be scattered by the molecule. And most of it will be scattered elastically, which means that it will have the same energy of the incoming light but a small fraction, which is 0 0.001%, it actually loses energy. And uh, this is called Raman scattering. And this loses energy because it's interacting with the molecular vibrations. So if you actually collect the intensity of the light as a function of the wavelength or the energy of, the, of your light, you can get something like this, which is a spectrum that identifies your molecule. And all of these peaks are corresponding to a singular molecular vibration, a molecular bond vibration. So let's go back to the vibrational system mechanism where we have all of these compound with these 
that are smelling the same, right? So turns out with Raman spectroscopy that actually these all have the same Raman frequency. So maybe actually, maybe our olfaction system could actually work like a Raman spectrometer, right? But there's a little detail that is missing here, which is that humans don't really shoot monochromatic laser beam from their nose. So we know that it has to do something with the vibration, right? But it cannot be Raman spectroscopy. And this is where quantum tunneling comes in. And before going into the specific mechanism, I want to talk about quantum tunneling a little bit. And I like to compare quantum tunneling to throwing a ball on a wall. I hope we can all agree that if I take a ball and I throw it on a, on a wall, it will never go through. It will always be bouncing back, right? Uh, we can schematize this as the wall being a, an energy barrier, a potential energy barrier. And in this case, the potential energy is just a gravitational energy. And this just means that if I want to throw the ball on the other side, I need to throw the ball above the wall. There's no way it can go through. But if I shrink down things to the extreme and I go to the single electron level and uh, to a barrier, which is very, very thin, just maybe the dimension of, let's say, five to 10 atoms, actually, the electron can just go directly through the barrier. And this is the quantum tunneling effect. And it's a bit difficult to imagine this if you're thinking about balls and, and, and particles. But as Abazot explained in an amazing way in the first introductory lecture, uh, the electrons and the quantum objects are not really particles. They are more like wave functions, so like a, a wave of probability. And uh, so we can actually picture it like this, where the electron can be with a certain probability in space distributed, right? So if I shoot my electron towards the barrier, I see that it comes here, and most of the time, these will be bounced back, like in the classical case. But there is a non-zero probability that the electron is actually on the other side of the wall of your tunneling barrier. And so what can happen is that the, the electron just goes through, and this is quantum tunneling. And for people that are enthusiastic about the equations and so on, this is the equation for the quantum tunneling, where this is the transmission probability. And they depend on many things like the height of the barrier, the energy of the electron, the distance here, and uh, the energy states of your materials. And uh, if you engineer your, uh, your experiments in a, in a suitable way, you can get information of all of these factors. And just a few examples of how quantum tunneling is used in physics, which is more my expertise, uh, is that you can use quantum tunneling to get very nice atomic resolution images where all of these are atoms. You can see the uh, honeycomb shape of graphene here. Or you can even pick up single atoms and move them around, and you can create fancy structures at the atomic level where all of these are just single atoms. Or like these people in IBM, they also made a, a movie in stop motion, just moving around atoms and taking images with uh, the concept of quantum tunneling. And they got the Guinness World Record for the smallest movie ever. And more recently, you can also, they also developed a technique which can do magnetic resonance and spin manipulation with a single electron, single spin resolution. And this is exactly what we're trying to do here at UCLA, at the Qubit Lab. And we aim to study this weird effect of current induced spin selectivity, which means that if you pass a current through a 
chiral biomolecule, this was discovered in DNA, for, for example, uh, you get a spin polarization uh, on the other side, which is very interesting. But if you want to have more details about this, you're interested, you just feel free to reach out and we'll be happy to talk. But apart from this digression, which I hope you found sort of interesting, let's go back to the basics of quantum tunneling. And uh, so another thing that we need to consider is that tunneling is an elastic process. So there is no loss of energy in the process, which means that if you have this situation where you have a let's call them donor and acceptor, and you have an energy state here with an electron and an energy state here at the same energy, which is uh, available, which is vacant, the tunneling can occur because they are the same energy. But if I have an empty state here at a different energy, the tunneling cannot, cannot happen because these two states are at, at a different energy. Okay, so if I have this situation where I just have one donor state here with an electron and one acceptor state here at a different energy, I cannot have tunneling unless I can put something in between. And if this something can absorb energy at exactly the energy difference between the donor state and the acceptor state, then Tunneling can occur. And this is called inelastic electron tunnel. And so basically, what happens is that energy is conserved in this way. The, the electron goes to the lower energy state, but it gives some energy to the molecule, which needs to have a vibrational state at that specific energy. And this is exactly what this guy, Luca Turin, proposed for the olfaction mechanism. So he proposed that I have something very similar, which is a, a, my receptor has a donor site and an acceptor site at a different energy. And uh, if I get a molecule, and let's say that this is one of the molecules that we were considering before with a sulfur hydrogen bond at the end that's smelling like rotten eggs, I is that a question? Okay. Okay. So if I put the molecule in the receptor, then if this energy difference is matching the energy of the vibration of this molecule, that the here in an elastic tunneling process can occur. So uh, basically, the, the molecule there will open up a, a path for the electrons to go from the donor side to the acceptor side. And the theory states that once the electron is in the acceptor side, then this triggers the opening of the ion channel, which then fires the neuron that goes to the olfactory bulb and so on. So uh, what he did was, okay, uh, let's find another molecule which is completely different, which is decaborine. And uh, the chemical structure is entirely different. The physical structure is entirely different. What this has is that it has a very similar vibrational frequency. So the idea is that our receptor that is responsible for the rotten egg smell should be able to use this molecule if the vibrational theory is correct, to tunnel the electron from the donor side to the acceptor side. And indeed, you have that these two completely different molecules smell exactly the same. And so this is amazing. This is a huge step forward for the vibrational theory of olfaction, but it's not enough to convince all the skeptical uh, physicists and biologists out there. So what he did was to, he investigated the isotope effect. And the isotope effect consists in, you can exchange hydrogen 
with deuterium in molecules. And uh, deuterium is just uh, an hydrogen with an additional uh, neutron in the nucleus. But deuterium is twice as heavy as hydrogen. So uh, what this means is that the vibrational uh, frequencies would be very different. And in the case of, the, of a carbon-hydrogen bond, it's around 85 from, from 85 to 93 terahertz. And in the case of the carbon deuterium is about 66. So his question was, do deuterated compounds smell different? So can I tell the difference between the normal compound and the deuterated compound? So he took this molecule, which is acetophenone, ACP, in the undeuterated normal form, and in the deuterated form, well, all the eight hydrogens in the molecule are replaced by deuterium. And what he did was just smell it. And uh, after smelling the two different compounds, he was like, oh yes, I'm amazing. My theory is correct. They smell completely different. But as you can imagine, this is not really proof for the, for the scientific community. And they were like, okay, let other people smell it that don't have a bias towards it. And uh, actually when they did, they couldn't tell the difference. And so what about it? Maybe the theory doesn't work, but still this is human perception. So at least I don't find it really scientific. So let's get more scientific, right? And to do that, they use Drosophila, which is the common fruit fly. And uh, the first question that you need to ask is, can these flies actually smell this ACP? And to answer that, they have this maze setup, which is kind of similar to the one where Nemo goes in one branch of the stream. And uh, they have the flies and they're flowing air with the with the other end on one side and just the air with just the solvent on the other side. And uh, what they measure is how flies respond to, to the smell. And so uh, they just see where they go. So if they wanna go towards the, the ACP or the other branch and what they found out is that they have a very strong preference going towards the ACP. They like the smell, uh, as you can see here. And so they can actually smell it. But what about the deuterated compounds? Uh, they tried with three different deuterated compounds and one which has three deuterium atoms, one which is five, and one which has eight. eight. And the response is very different. In the case of three, there's still a slight preference going towards the ACP. And uh, in the case of five and eight, they want to go the other way. So they don't really like the smell. Uh, so these can already tell you that they can actually distinguish between them, but they actually put it to a direct comparison. And uh, you get that if you flow here, the deuterated compounds with eight deuterium atoms, and the ACP in the normal state on the other side, they have a very strong preference going toward the ACP. So amazing. We know right now that vibrational properties are linked to the olfaction system, right? But there are still some limitations to this theory. And the main one arguably is chiral molecules. And these two molecules are limonene and dipentene, and they have the same molecular bonds and the same vibrational properties. And the only thing that changes between them is that they're mirror images of each other. So the only thing that changes is that is this lower group, which if you see it in three dimension, one is going inside of your screen and one is going outside of your screen. So for the vibrational theory, they should smell exactly the same. They have the same vibrational energy, right? But turns out that these molecules actually smell different. One lemonine smells like lemon, 
and the other one smells like pine cones and resin. And so how do you explain that? And uh, it seems that vibrations cannot really explain the whole of faction by themselves, but the shape of the molecule must also be involved in some way. So probably, uh, okay. Uh, but to draw just some conclusions, we have seen that, hopefully I convinced you that there's strong evidence that olfaction is related to both vibrations and shape of the molecule. And the most widely accepted theory and model right now is a combination of the vibrational theory and the shape theory, where only small parts of the molecule are involved in the locking mechanism. But this is very much an open field, and uh, we still are missing a direct experimental verification that quantum tunneling is actually occurring in the receptors. And uh, um, also another big thing that is missing is that we don't have a structure, we don't know the structure of the olfactory receptors. And this would be, of course, a huge step forward in the in the understanding of the olfaction process. So just to give you a, a couple of messages, which is the takeaway of, of today, is that I think it's pretty cool that everyday life phenomena that we give for, for granted, like smelling things, are actually re regulated by very weird quantum effects, like quantum tunneling. And uh, another thing that is not just related to olfaction, but quantum biology in general, is that quantum biology is a field that is extremely rich with unanswered questions. And uh, as Rob Phillips said in the last lecture, and yeah, if you didn't watch it, I strongly encourage you to watch it because I thought it was amazing. Uh, he said that to do research, if you want to be a researcher, what all you need to do is find a question, an unanswered question that you like and that you feel you can spend your life trying to solve and answer. And so our hope with this, this course and not just this, this lecture is that to help you find that question that you like and you think it's worth answering. And thank you. And if you have questions, please shoot. No question. Is it early? It's a bit early. So please entertain me and us in these minutes. If you're curious about anything, hopefully we can answer. Yes, you're welcome to just unmute yourself and ask questions or you're welcome to put it in the chat as well. So you had mentioned myriad applications. Is there a timeline as far as this and maybe the next three years, this specific case kind of figuring out and others? Uh, what, what kind of applications do you mean, sorry? Oh, I'm just basing what you said. So you said yeah. there's a lot of applications for it. Are there oh. timelines as far as, do you need obviously better quantum computing hardware? Is it the software or are there hybrids? Like what are some of the methods? Oh, well, I think most of it is, is actually to acknowledge the field because right now quantum biology is a very interdisciplinary field, which is not, has not like funding calls or, or something like that. So it's kind of hard for people to get funding and uh, actually do experiments on quantum biology itself because physicists have their physics calls 
for funding and biologists have theirs and they're not really talking to each other. So I think one problem is the funding, of course, and making these is quantum biology more more widespread and uh, and get like get it known to a wider population and make it a field on its own, which I think it needs to to be at some point. And this is one. And uh, of course, uh, there's quantum computing uh, applications, and uh, you can use quantum computers, of course, to to study quantum biology. Uh, but that's it's not just that you you need to find better ways of isolating receptors for for instance in this case it's just science that needs to to advance yeah. on many levels in my opinion well one thing that pops up is is quantum sensing so if you looked into yeah. so dynamic yeah, quantum yeah, sensors yeah. uh there was just a recent paper on those uh Kind of promising. They've been used anywhere from rat's heart, uh, basically centimeter to millimeter resolution, uh, an order of magnitude. EV batteries, um, you know, for basically for UV kind of stuff. Uh, what have you yeah. uncovered in sen sensing? So, in sensing, uh, I'm not the expert here. Yeah, Alba Salt and Atsumi more, know more than me. But actually, what we're trying to do is actually exploit the the concept of MV centers and quantum sensing, but directly into biological matter. We strongly believe, and there's evidence that you can have the same effects that you have on a nitrogen vacancy center directly into spin sensitive proteins like cryptochrome. So you use the same concept to do, to do a, a direct investigation on the biological matter that you want to study without even using the MD centers. So this is quantum sensing using biology. Yeah, there, uh, there's quantum qubits, all these types of things. Now, this field in quantum sensing with diamond sensors, back in 09, they wanted to use them for tips on the end of rods, like uh, MRIs, but more specific, so you don't have to run a whole patient. And it took until last year to figure out the algorithm for the fluorescence, it's fluorescence-based sensing with uh, quantum effect. Uh, to measure the red light. So there should be more coming with that. But what you had mentioned is is basically there's a paper out, there's other pa there's papers on what you just said, right? As yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, chemi chemical qubits and those types of things. Yeah. Um, but obviously, you know, eh, for my kind of stuff, it's more brain and not going invasive at this point. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, yeah, I'd say there's there's upside in 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 what you just mentioned. Yeah, and for instance, my specific project is more towards the quantum computing side, and we are trying to do spin resonance on uh, single single molecules at the single electron scale, and we're trying to figure out if these chiral molecules can actually prove to be effective spin rotators. So if you if you can insert quantum superpositions, so spin superpositions in the molecules and have an effective rotation. So they may be act as a logic gate for spin qubits. Or otherwise they they can also act as readouts and uh, and initialization of qubits. So that's more towards the quantum computing for interest. Any other question? So I was um, just uh, wondering if, uh, for example, in the uh, case of listening or hearing auditory sensors, we have these small uh, cilia or some sort of uh, cantilever system, which uh, tries to detect uh, various frequencies. And uh, just like, uh, I mean, we understand that one, one frequency is not just resonant frequency for one particular uh, vibrating um, part, I mean, vibrating object, but rather there is a spiral. And because of the spiral and with a minimum number of uh, vibrating uh, objects, the body is able to um, sort of do demultiplexing or other sort of a Fourier transform 
and uh, I fingerprint somebody's voice or somebody's, um, you know, a direction, for example, or, you know, take time, timing measurements of a uh, binaural system is through these small little uh, differences in comparisons. Now, we do we think in terms of the vibrational uh, olfactory system also could use um, some sort of a demultiplexing and multiplexing because it has so many epithelial cells and it, it looks like there must be some sort of a, uh, a, a larger order parameter that, that also needs to be looked at, not just a single sensor, but an array of a sensor. And then we should look at uh, its Fourier transform imaging sort of again, in terms of X, Y, or a timing in, in that way. What do you think uh, it would be a good idea to do that? Oh, I think that's an extremely good point. That it's an amazing idea. And uh, I totally agree. Uh, it, it, it's kind of difficult to, to do it right now, I think, because we still don't really know the mechanism at the single receptor. But in the future, of course, that needs to be done, I think, because, uh, yeah, it's not just the single thing. Like, as physicists, we, we really like to isolate things, but biology doesn't work that way. I'm, I'm learning that right now. But yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. Thank you for your comment. That, that was really, really nice. And uh, yeah, if you have a sudden Natsumi has to add something about that, I think it's a really cool idea. Yeah, that's actually very interesting and to the point. Uh, this is perhaps one of the things that we are uh, actually aiming at uh, in quantum biology. Like you want to also a kind of uh, uh, design a uh, small scale kind of uh, spectrometer, like with several receptors, and then try to really understand how this olfactory system works, like the, the connection between the receptors and so on. Awesome. Are there any other questions? Okay, uh, I, I think it doesn't seem so, right? Yeah. And Natsumi, do you want to announce the next uh, talk or? When is it? Uh, it? It is November 30 by Paul Davis. And it is how life began. Yeah, of so, course, uh, next yeah. week, there's no Fiat Lux because it's Thanksgiving in the US. Yes, and happy Thanksgiving, by the way. So that, that means the next lecture is not on Friday, right? Uh, it's on the Friday after, I think. No, or he even... said November 30th, that's Wednesday. Oh, yeah. Yeah, November 30th, because Powell was only available at this time here. Yeah. OK, sorry about that. Yeah. So Wednesday, November 30th, next lecture. The, what time? 11 a.m. in 11, California? 11 again? Okay, yes, okay. Yes. Okay, so everyone, next lecture, uh, next Friday, we don't have a lecture because it's holiday here. And our next Friday, uh, next lecture will be Wednesday, November 30th, 11 a.m. in California. So same time as usual, but just please note that it's Wednesday instead of Friday. Great. Thanks everyone again uh, for joining us and uh, have a lovely weekend. Bye, everybody. Bye.